Advent is my favorite liturgical season. I love Advent so much, in fact, that I've been celebrating it for four weeks already, seriously. Like I started it early because I just needed extra Advent this year. I love Advent because it's the perfect counterpoint to what I call the Christmas crazies. Um, when our culture goes into full on consumer mode, you know, every, well, starting the day after Thanksgiving, earlier now. Um, and every turn you hear music telling you to have a holly jolly Christmas and our frenzied to-do lists get longer than our arms. Advent gets quiet at this time of year. It gets contemplative. It turns inward and it asks us to think about ultimate things, right? Even with the apocalyptic themes that we hear during Advent, it's asking us to think about the big, big, big picture. And Advent makes space for everything that the commercial Christmas season doesn't, everything that our culture would rather have us sweep under the rug um, and put on a, a jolly face, at least for a few weeks this time of year, makes space for grief, for, for loss, for suffering and pain, for illness, tragedy. It makes space for injustice, for poverty, for, for looking at, at the ills of our world. But Advent holds all of these things in the light of faith. As our days grow darker and shorter in the Northern Hemisphere this time of year, each light, I love it that, you know, the days get a little bit shorter each day and each week we light another candle and then another candle and then another candle. So the light that we're creating together grows. Advent embraces paradox. We place all of our faith in a God of love. And yet, and yet the world doesn't look as we know that God of love would have it. It doesn't yet reflect God's dream for it. Contemplating this paradox, not trying to avoid it or circumventing it, but entering into the heart of this paradox prepares us to receive the light of the world, the light that shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. John the Baptist always takes center stage in Advent. He gets two Sundays, sometimes even three Sundays of Advent, where he gets to kind of be the main guy. His camel hair clothing, his locust breast, his fiery sermons, you know, and the people come out, I think just a prophet gawk, like, what's he going to do next? What's he going to say? What's going to happen when he puts the water on your head? John follows 20th century author Flannery O'Connor. When she, she was asked why she wrote such violent and disturbing stories, she said, you know what? Sometimes to get people's attention, you got to yell. And John yells, right? You brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, right? He, 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 and he goes on from there. He's just getting warmed up, right? And when the people, you know, moved and, and torn and, and brought to their knees by his powerful preaching say, what should we do? What would you have us do? He basically tells them not to be jerks. That's it. He says, you know what, if you have two coats, give one to somebody who doesn't have any coats. You know, don't rob, don't steal, don't cheat, quit lying, quit taking more than is your due. Be satisfied with what you get. And, um, you know, the interesting thing is the soldiers and the tax collectors who are particularly called out in the passage, for them to just behave in an ethical manner would have actually thrown a monkey wrench in the corrupt systems of their day right? Because the whole oppressive system of the Roman Empire depended on these people, each of them getting their own little extra, right? And keeping the people oppressed. And just imagine if everybody did what John says here. If everybody was just, you know, a good, a good honest person, wouldn't the world look a whole lot more like God's dream for it? Wouldn't there be a whole lot more, a whole lot less suffering and injustice and poverty for us to try to sweep under the rug and ignore. So it's interesting. But the kicker comes next. 
Because after John tells them this, he says, you know what? This is only the starting point. I'm only the warm-up act. All of this, you know, hard work of living an ethical life in an unethical world, that just gets you to the front door. Right? The one who is coming after me is more powerful than I am. He will baptize you with spirit and with fire. What the heck? Those are powerful words. And I, and I invite you to contemplate them in your heart because your guess about what they mean is as good as mine. It's a different picture than gentle Jesus, meek and mild, right? Here's my take on it. Something that, that what Jesus offers, that, that all that hard work of being an ethical person just gets you to the front door. What Jesus offers is, is come on into the building. Come on into the full embrace of a relationship with a God of love, with a God that can bring you joy and peace that passes all understanding, no matter what happens in this world around you. That's the invitation something much richer, something much deeper, a light that shines in the darkness and no darkness can overcome it. So Advent embraces paradox and seems at odds with the culture and the world around us, but, but Advent also has paradox embedded in its very fabric and, and no Sunday um, shows this forth more powerfully than this third Sunday of Advent. We light the pink candle, you might've noticed, a lot of people think the pink candle is the fourth Sunday, but it's actually the third Sunday. Gaudete, Rejoicing Sunday. That's, that's what today is. And just like that pink candle stands in sharp, representing joy in this kind of somber season, stands in sharp contrast to the other three dark purple candles, we have this contrast between the first couple of readings, which embrace and embody joy and hope, right? Um, and, and John's fiery... Uh, fire and brimstone preaching. Isaiah says, you will draw water with rejoicing from the springs of salvation. And Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. And in case you missed it the first time, I'm going to say it again, rejoice. And it's, it can be hard to hear those words in Paul's injunction, rejoice always when we do bear so much difficulty in this world, when our hearts are breaking. But it's important to remember that Paul wrote those words from prison and he was expecting his ex execution. He was awaiting the end of his life when he said, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And Isaiah wrote his words to a people in exile, a people who had been forcibly dragged from their homelands and did not know if and when they would ever get a chance to return. Surely it is God who saves me. I will trust in him and not be afraid. Have you ever felt two completely contradictory things at the same time? I just want you to think about that for a minute. An experience where you had maybe both angst and joy at the same time, or trepidation and excitement. I experienced that um, just recently with Reverend Ann's call. I had both the desolation of knowing that she was leaving, we'd have to kind of pick up the pieces and put things together here at Grace Church, but absolute confidence that this is where God was calling her and complete joy for her, somebody that I had mentored coming into her own. Just how, how joyful and beautiful is that, right? And these two things coexisting at the same time. I wonder if that's ever happened to you. It's a sharp experience, right? A sharpening, a maybe a clarifying experience. I think the beauty of nature for me so often lies in the interplay of light and darkness on a day um, when there's both clouds and sunshine and the sunshine filters through the clouds, incredible. Or, a, or the dappled light as you go through a forest. 
Um, or the interplay of light and dark at dawn and dusk, right? These are some of the most beautiful times in our natural world. And artists tell me if there weren't both light and shadow, there would be no art. There's something that this interplay of, of light and, and, and darkness, of joy and shadow and difficulty sharpens in us. And I think that it's a longing. I think that it brings forth in us a longing for more, for more God, right? Not just more of the good stuff and, you know, gimme, gimme, but, but more of what's deep and real and true that deep joy, that abiding peace that passes understanding. And I think that's what Advent is truly meant to stir up in us. The joy that we're invited to this stir up, this is sometimes called stir up Sunday because of the collect at the beginning. Um, anybody with English ancestry has usually told me that it's also a reminder to go home and stir up the Christmas puddings, right? So, so I, I think that there's really something to that because it's meant to stir something up in us as well, right? Joy um, and the deep and abiding presence of hope and faith and love and light that no external circumstances can negate. John tells us that basic honesty and generosity and ethical life, that's the starting gate. You can't experience the abiding joy in the presence of what is real without being real with yourself, right? But what Jesus offers is that light that shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. Each week I read author and theologian Debbie Thomas um, on a website called journeywithjesus.net. And it's one of the best things that I read every single week. I, I commend it to you. This week she wrote this. Joy, is, joy requires us to sidestep both sentimentality and cynicism. It requires that we hold on to two realities at once. The reality of the world's brokenness in one hand and the reality of God's love in the other. Joy is what happens when we daily live into the belief that God can and will bridge the gap between the world we long for and the world we see before our eyes. It is a posture, an orientation, a practice, a willingness to sit gently and persistently in the tension of the not yet, trusting that God's peace will guard our hearts and minds in this in-between place for as long as it takes. Bishop Barry reminded us two weeks ago that God is faithful, that the, the invitation of these apocalyptic times is to trust that God is at work, bringing forth more justice, more truth, more light, more peace into the world, whether it seems on the surface to be true in this exact moment or not. And last week, Reverend Wendy reminded us that God is present to us in each and every moment if we can only open ourselves to the awareness of God in another person or in the beauty of nature, that that peace is just a breath away. We'd be hard-pressed to think of a better set of instructions for living into this posture of joy than Paul himself gave, writing from prison, awaiting his death. And as I spent time with this well-known and beloved scripture from Philippians this week, I was on retreat a couple of days, the last couple of, last couple of days here, and I re- committed it to heart so I could sort of ponder it over and over and repeat it to myself. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'm going to say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, with prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, 
will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.